Honesty certainly has its merits, but how many times have you lied to protect yourself or even someone you love? Today, we'll explore the power of deception as I provide a concise explanation of the incredibly convoluted story of Lies of P. And by the end of the video, you'll discover exactly what makes us human. In a world where alchemy and automated puppets usher in a new age of technology, the secrets that lie beneath the surface have the power to change reality as you know it. This is the story of Geppetto's puppet. This is the story of Lies of P. But before we journey to the ruins of Krat, it's time to give credit where it's due. Kudos to Huka Alves 172 yet again for locating the easter egg hidden in the last thumbnail. If you look closely, you will notice that Pinocchio is hidden in the bottom left hand side of the border. If you're new to the channel, I started playing a game with viewers where I hide an easter egg in the thumbnail of each of my videos. The first person to state what and where it is in the comments gets a shout out in the following video. Now, back to the matter at hand. Before the discovery of Ergo, the city of Krat was simply a poor coastal village. It wasn't until a group of alchemists excavated a nearby cave called the Relic of Tresmegistus that the people were propelled into a golden age where technological advancements and prosperity elevated the standard of living to brand new heights. Ergo was an incredibly efficient source of energy that outmatched any type of fuel before it. Even electricity paled in comparison to this inexplicable mineral. The alchemists' influence on the land was undeniable, yet they always remained at a safe distance, observing and pulling the strings from the shadows. Eventually, genius inventor Geppetto created puppets that were powered by Ergo, and daily tasks such as cooking, cleaning, and even police work became a fully automated process. The city of Krat was ready to share their inventions with the world, and they scheduled the Grand Exhibition, an event that would showcase the power of Ergo to the world. However, the people of Krat would never have this opportunity. A disaster known as the Puppet Frenzy made sure of that. Despite their programming, the once loyal and harmless puppets became an army of murderous automatons. Thousands of people died, and those that survived were stuck behind locked doors and barred windows. To make matters worse, prolonged exposure to highly concentrated ergo and inhalation of its spores caused a terrible sickness known as the petrification disease, which resulted in the hardening of one's skin, blindness, and eventually organ failure. The great city of Kraut was no more, and the few survivors that remained battled against a deadly plague. It was into this world that Geppetto's puppet was born, and where his story would begin. Amidst the chaos, a mystical blue butterfly would give life to a puppet who had the power of free will. A soft voice stirred him awake and requested his aid. She introduced herself as Sophia and invited him to the hotel so she could explain what was going on. After locating his guide, Gemini, and arming himself with a weapon, Geppetto's puppet took his first steps into the dangerous streets of Krat. After navigating his way through Krat Central Station, he found himself at the heart of the city. The hotel was nearby, but he would have to face off with a gigantic puppet designed for festivities before he could reach his goal. After a grueling battle, Geppetto's puppet emerged victorious and was contacted by Sophia. She informed him that the hotel's security restricted access to puppets and he would have to lie in order to gain entry. Geppetto's puppet passed the test. As he lied, the gears within him began to shudder with change. Sophia greeted him at the door and gifted him the Moon Phase Pocket Watch. This watch had the power to turn back time to when the boy was in peak condition. Keep this in mind for later. Sophia reassured him that Geppetto would be able to answer the many questions he certainly had, and he had to be located first. She pointed him in the direction of Elysian Boulevard, and off he went. As the inventor of the puppets, Geppetto was the target of many angry survivors who questioned the reasons behind the puppet frenzy. The Mad Donkey was no exception. This marked the first time Geppetto's puppet would shed human blood, but it would not be the last. Geppetto was rescued and returned to the hotel. After dealing with a threat at City Hall, Geppetto's puppet, who I will now refer to as the boy, met with the patrons of the hotel, including Antonia, its owner, Eugenie, and Paul and Dina, the concierge. The boy went upstairs to speak with Geppetto, but instead of answers, he received orders to go and save Lorenzini Venini, a genius inventor who had gone to shut down his factory since the puppets were using it as a main base to create more of their kind. 
Once the boy arrived, he rescued Vanini and his puppet Pulcinella before destroying Fuoco, a powerful puppet who was hellbent on storming the St. Frangelico Cathedral. After some investigation, it was revealed that he had been following the orders of the Puppet King, who was stationed at Rosa Isabel Street. But there was a more urgent matter at hand. The cathedral held many refugees who fled there during the puppet frenzy, so the boy went to investigate. When he arrived, a stalker known as the Atoned warned him that the cathedral was no longer a safe haven. In fact, all the people who had gone there for sanctuary never returned. It seemed puppets weren't the only threat to the people of Krat. The carcasses of victims of the petrification disease were running amok and murdering everyone in sight. Fortunately, there were several survivors. Giangio, a self-proclaimed pharmacist, was in search of gold coin fruit so he could cure his illness. This intriguing young man had a wealth of knowledge about alchemy, medicine, and the power of wishes. Keep this in mind for later. Sister Cecile was inside the cathedral walls, and sadly, she was the only one who hadn't succumbed to the disease, or the monster that stalked the shadows. She was concerned about the Archbishop, and feared the worst. Lastly, Alidoro the treasure hunter was allegedly in search of a safe house, and presumably, a place to set up shop. After much exploration, the boy finally found Archbishop Andreas. His dealings with the alchemist along with his greed had resulted in his downfall and monstrous transformation. This particular encounter has tons of lore implications that we'll discuss in a dedicated video, but suffice it to say that his death was part of a much bigger plan. Someone had been pulling the strings from the shadows and siphoned the ergo from all of the boy's previous battles. The stage was set, and events beyond our understanding were about to take place. The boy returned to the hotel and shared the news of the carcass creatures. Due to its proximity to the cathedral, the Malum district was likely in disarray and Sophia asked the boy to confirm her suspicions. Before he left, Vanini gave him an ergo wavelength decoder that would collect information from any puppets he destroyed and possibly give him more insight on the root cause of the puppet frenzy. The Malum district was home to the Black Rabbit Brotherhood, a group of infamous stalkers who were loyal only to themselves. The inevitable encounter between the boy and the Black Rabbit Brotherhood ensued, and the eldest brother was killed in the conflict. It was revealed that they had been working closely with the alchemists in order to provide them with a steady supply of gold coin fruit for their experiments. Interestingly enough, the golden tree that bore this highly sought after fruit was located in a hidden chamber of the hotel. Somehow, Giangio caught wind of this and located the tree, excited to share his discovery with the boy. However, he was unable to pick the fruit. In fact, it burned his skin when he touched it. So he asked the boy to give him the fruit in exchange for wishes and other rewards. The boy was also able to retrieve Geppetto's most prized painting, a portrait of a young boy. Now it was time to confront the Puppet King. The next stop was Estella Opera House, located at the end of Rosa Isabel Street. The boy had much to overcome and the very fact that he was a puppet made him a target in the eyes of the White Lady, who was actually Adelina Corday's sister. Adelina was a famous opera singer whose fame was unmatched. Initially, the two sisters shared the stage and sang side by side, but Adelina secretly sabotaged her sister's voice, forcing her to take the path of the stalkers. Unaware of this, the White Lady sought to kill every puppet, since she believed they had taken her sister from her. Little did she know that Adelina was safely tucked away at the opera house. The two would eventually be reunited in the sweet embrace of death. The boy made it to the main stage and watched the play unfold before him. It showed Geppetto removing the heart of a person that looked identical to the boy and placing it inside of a puppet. After bowing out, the play ended. Was this how Geppetto's puppet had been created? The puppet king entered the scene and reached out in a gesture of peace, but was rejected. Unable to clearly communicate, he resorted to violence to articulate his message. The boy was unable to understand the puppet language, despite its familiarity. Only bits and pieces could be interpreted, but in this foreign world, the boy was neither puppet nor human. However, one thing was certain, the king of puppets was not his true enemy. The king tried to reveal the identity of the one responsible for the puppet frenzy, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. The boy pressed on, and the Puppet King's shell was broken. Inside, a puppet named Romeo was set free. In his desperation, 
Romeo had no other choice but to kill the boy so that he could liberate the puppets. Sadly, Romeo was outmatched and ultimately died to the hands of the boy. In his dying breath, he said the following in the language of the puppets. Maybe this is what real freedom feels like. Thanks, Carlo. But who or what was he trying to free the puppets from? And who was Carlo? After the boy left the stage, he was surprised to see Geppetto in the alley. Apparently, he was so concerned for the boy that he came to the opera house in the event his aid was needed. After congratulating the boy for dethroning the puppet king, he tasked him to go to the grand exhibition in search of the rumored cure the alchemist had recently announced to combat the petrification disease. Antonia's condition was worsening, and it was the only hope for the people afflicted by the illness. While she gazed at her portrait, she asked if she still had any semblance of the beauty she once had, and the boy lied once again to preserve the old woman's dignity. She saw through it, but appreciated the gesture nonetheless. As he uttered that lie, the ergo inside him began to whisper. The boy was changing. But he wasn't the only one experiencing these feelings. Polandina, Antonia's butler puppet, had recently awakened and expressed his feelings of affection towards Antonia. He embraced his newfound ego and decided to continue serving her in peace. Upstairs, in Geppetto's study, the portrait began to change. As the boy experienced humanity, the portrait's nose grew in proportion. The boy journeyed to the Grand Exhibition, where he learned the true nature of this so-called cure. Champion Victor was a hero amongst the people of Krat. His feats of strength and skill were unmatched in the wrestling arena. However, even Victor was no match for the incurable illness he suffered from. Eventually, he died, proving that he was only human after all. But this wasn't the end of his legend. With the help of their new cure, the alchemist did the impossible and brought Victor back from the dead. The people of Krat were amazed. Due to his status as a legendary wrestler, the Hercules of Krat was scheduled to face off with a puppet in the Grand Exhibition to showcase his might. Ironically enough, he would do battle with a puppet, but the result of the match would only be witnessed by one person. Simon Manus, the leader of the Alchemists, congratulated the boy on his victory over the old champ. After all, it was he who had resurrected him and given him his superhuman strength and abilities. Victor had been subjected to experimentation with purified ergo. Through the process of forced evolution, he was able to not only survive the petrification disease, but transcend human limitations. It seemed the alchemist's cure was simply a madman's attempt at achieving godhood. This was made possible only through the use of ergo, which was revealed to be the human soul in crystal form. Each fragment of ergo contained the memories, lifespan, and essence of the person it once inhabited. It was because of the nature of ergo that puppets seemed so lifelike. The perversion of something so divine resulted in a sort of necromancy that trapped the souls of the dead and puppets bound by the Grand Covenant, which forced them to peacefully serve, obey, and refrain from using free will. Naturally, this was a recipe for disaster and ultimately resulted in the puppet frenzy, the petrification disease, and the carcass monsters. Ergo was the key to it all. The boy returned to the hotel and spoke with Polandina, who was eager to find a cure for Antonia. Giangio offered to make a cure, but in the end, the boy instructed Polandina to grant Antonia a natural death and avoid the possible side effects of the tonic. It was a difficult decision but one that further bolstered the ever-growing humanity within the boy. The next stop was the Isle of the Alchemists, but there were two major obstacles preventing passage. One, nobody knew the exact location of the island, and two, the only way to get there was by submarine. A rare golden ergo enhanced by electricity was the only known device capable of powering a vessel that large, and the barren swamp was the most likely place to find one. Unfortunately, it was also the home of a legendary monster that made a nest from the endless piles of puppet parts and bodies that were dumped there illegally over the years. But the boy was determined. He defeated the green swamp monster and located a golden ergo shard. On the way back to the hotel, the boy received a distress signal from Sophia, stating that the hotel was being attacked. The stargazers lost connection and were unable to transport him, so he raced across the city to reach his friends. When he arrived, the hotel was in shambles. The alchemists had hired the Black Rabbit Brotherhood to abduct Geppetto for reasons unknown. 
It seemed that Simon Manus was behind it all, and only he could provide the answers the boy needed. Antonio revealed that there was a secret passage to a dock below the hotel where the alchemists would transport the golden fruit coins back and forth from their aisle. The entrance was hidden behind Antonio's portrait, and by playing a series of special chords, the pathway would be revealed. On his way to the portrait, Sophia stopped the boy and revealed the true reason why she awakened him. She had escaped from there in search of a hero who could save the people of Krat and free her true physical form from the prison it was locked in. The Sophia the boy had been interacting with all along was nothing more than a projection. As a listener, Sophia had a special connection with Ergo and as such, she was able to tap into its limitless power. Keep this in mind for later. The boy journeyed through the passageway until he reached the relic of Trismegistus, which was the cavern that housed the Ergo crystals. The path to the dock was guarded by the remaining Black Rabbit Brotherhood, who ambushed the boy. However, he was able to defeat the remaining brothers and face off with the newly evolved eldest brother. In their anguish, the brothers sought out the aid of the alchemists in return for their services. They sacrificed everything so their big brother could be brought back from the dead after battling the boy in the Malam district several days earlier. Little did they know, their brother would never be the same. After clearing the way, the boy finally reached the dock and saw the Pistris submarine, which is Greek for a sea monster or whale, alluding to the legendary Moby Dick. He took the submarine to the isle and found Sophia waiting on the shore. She revealed to him that she was the daughter of Valentinus, the original leader of the alchemists. After his death, Simon assumed leadership and released the petrification disease in Krat. Aware of Sophia's abilities, he transformed her into a tool to further his plans. Once Sophia discovered that the petrification disease was quite literally freezing time and memories within the infected person, she realized that she could manipulate time itself through Ergo. She used her power to wind back time so that Geppetto's puppet could confront Simon and prevent his new world order from ever becoming a reality. If you recall, the moon-faced pocket watch from the beginning of the boy's journey was simply an extension of her power that allowed him to avoid any fatal injuries by rewinding time in the event of his imminent death or destruction. This was how she protected the boy and ensured his success. The fact that he was a puppet granted him the strength to defend himself, and an immunity to the petrification disease, not to mention his ability to exercise free will, making him the perfect candidate for her cause. Sophia admitted that she had deceived him and was initially not concerned with Krat, but her own freedom. Over time that changed, and although she still awaited her peace and death, she had grown invested in the mission to save Krat. The boy walked across the sands of time and stormed the abbey. When he got to the bridge, Laxasia the Complete guarded the way to the tower. She was the first and most perfect of Simon's creations. She was the pinnacle of forced evolution, and alongside her master would usher in the age of ascension. However, Carlo had other plans and stopped her dead in her tracks. Despite her immense power, it couldn't hold a candle against the human trait of determination. He made his way inside and witnessed Sophia suffering firsthand. He made the difficult decision to give her peace and absorb her area into his body. This filled him with a warmth that only a human could experience. Geppetto's puppet was no more. Carlo had found his new identity, and as such, he would be the author of his own story. It's interesting to note that the author who wrote the original novel, The Adventures of Pinocchio, was named Carlo Collodi. Back at the hotel, Vanini was hard at work deciphering the ergo wavelengths Carlo had recorded. There was a message from Romeo, the puppet king. In this message, a secret law of the Grand Covenant was revealed. The first law stated that all puppets must obey their creator's commands, and the unknown Law Zero identified the creator as none other than Geppetto. He was the one responsible for the puppet frenzy, but why? Only time would tell. Carlo listened to a special recording left for his ears only. Romeo reminded him that they had grown up together in the Monad charity house and that they were best friends. As the puppet king, he was making a stand against the petrification disease and the alchemists, and he had sent numerous puppets to relay the message, which explained why each of the bosses spoke in the puppet language during the battles. Carlo had destroyed them all, unaware that they were simply trying to communicate to him in an attempt to join forces against the true threat looming over Krat. It was time to slay a false god. 
Simon Manus patiently waited at the top of the tower in his newly evolved form. Most of his body was hidden under a large cloth, hinting towards something sinister. The inevitable battle began, and true to form, Simon had been holding back. He unveiled the arm of God and transformed into an ergo-infused monstrosity, but in the end, the false god was no match for Carlo. In his dying breath, Simon left Carlo an ominous warning about Geppetto. As Carlo descended the tower, he was met with an eerily cheerful Geppetto. He showered Carlo with praise and thanked him for executing every one of his commands. Geppetto explained how he had created the puppet for this very purpose. He needed a strong vessel to carry his son's heart and collect a massive amount of ergo in order to resurrect his real son. However, Carlo's heart was the final piece of the puzzle. Carlo refused to hand it over and lose his humanity for such a vain pursuit. Geppetto was furious and decided to take the heart by force. He removed the glove from his left hand, mirroring the relic of the arm of God, and animated his original son's corpse to retrieve the heart. An epic battle ensued, and the nameless puppet and Carlo held nothing back. The shell that was once Carlo's human body went for a killing blow aimed directly for his enemy's heart, but in a panic, Geppetto leapt in the way, shielding the heart he coveted above all else. Carlo rammed his fist to the nameless puppet's chest, destroying it in the process. As he went to comfort Geppetto in his final moments, he shed a tear, causing the man he called a father to apologize for his sins. Carlo walked towards the balcony where a puppet shaped like Sophia sat lifeless. He knelt down and offered his very own ergo to grant her the gift of a new life, sacrificing himself in the process. When she came to, she embraced him in her arms grateful for the puppet who had become a real boy, leaving us with a mirror image of the Saintess of Mercy. The after credit scene revealed that Giangio was the true puppet master all along. In fact, he had been pulling the strings behind the incident he referred to as the Crot Experiment. He was no pharmacist. He was the legendary alchemist known as Philippus Parcelsus. He made mention of a new brother being born, retrieving the arm, and most notably a key by the name of Dorothy, who just so happened to have a pair of ruby red slippers. We are left in shock as the connection between the adventures of Pinocchio and the Wizard of Oz seem to meld together in this world where time and space overlap in ways we never could have imagined. And that's all for this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe. It helps me know that you want more content just like this. Click on these videos on screen to continue your journey, and I'll be there to guide you when you arrive. Consider becoming a member for exclusive perks like emojis, members only videos, and more. Or check out my Ko-fi or Patreon page if you want some behind the scenes content, or if you just want to support me in a more personal way. Until next time, it's the Inhuman One, signing out. Join the Inhuman community today.